Gianni Buterno Chapeau is the portrait of Modigliani's partner and the love of his life, Gianni Buterno. It was a romantic, intense and ultimately tragic love story between the two um, because Modigliani in 1920 died young and Jeanne couldn't stand uh, living alone without him so she took her own life when she was pregnant with uh, their second child. This intense passion is actually translated in this wonderful portrait which is of course a homage to his beloved. The body is depicted with a very sinuous curve, uh, which of course finds its moment of uh, sublimation in the wonderful long neck. The head is an idea of a head, of a portrait. Um, it's incredibly stylized and idealized, very sculptural. Clearly uh, he's looking at Brancusi, his fellow artist and friend, and her wonderful blue eyes that he actually remembers always uh, in his letters, are almonds of pure blue, which is again one of the characteristics and the signatures of the artist. I think that you can see um, the warmth and the light and actually the um, joie de vivre that came with the, the end of the war in the colours that the artist chose, uh, apricot and green in the background, against which the black of her dress stands very dramatically. This picture also has a great pedigree. It was exhibited at the 13th Venice Biennale in 1922, the first important recognition in his home country. Minotaur aveugle conduit par une petite fillette dates from 1934. The Minotaur became a, an increasing uh, a central figure in, in Picasso's oeuvre and would culminate the following year in 1935 with his master print, the Minotaur Maquis. Picasso identified very strongly with the, uh, the theme of the Minotaur and the Minotaur himself. This once powerful creature who first appears in Picasso's work um, as a, a, a symbol of virility and, and, and power, but very soon becomes a, a more of a tragic figure as in the present work. Picasso had met and fallen in love with Marie Therese uh, and depicted her in, in many of the, the most famous uh, lyrical works um, from the early 30s in his oeuvre. Marie Therese in the present work stands as a beacon of, of youth and, and purity and beauty. And as she leads the, the Minotaur very tenderly across the work, uh, you get this incredibly poignant uh, touch between the Minotaur uh, and Marie Therese. Um, this once powerful creature uh, now reduced to being led uh, by uh, a young girl uh, clutching a bunch of flowers. Um, one can see in the background of, of this work um, classical figures, um, the, the azure sea of, of Greece, echoing the, the myth of the Minotaur, reflecting the culture of contemporary Spain, where the, the bullfight was such an important source of inspiration for Picasso. Jeune fille à la Moresque, Robe Verte, was painted by Matisse in 1921. This is Nice. And this is the artist room uh, at number one, place Charles Félix. The model is Henriette Daricarère, who was Matisse's muse of the 20s. Here she wears a gandura, a billowing light Moroccan dress, which is lit up by this brightest green. Color is really at the center of Matisse's attention here. It is the joy of the South, the joy of the end of the war, the joy of the heat of summer, from which Henriette is finding protection inside the room. We can feel this heat behind the window and be behind the shutters. Aside from colour, Matisse is delighting in the arabesque, the pleasure of pure decoration, decoration in the carpet, in the wallpaper, in the play of the shutters themselves. Two details are really remarkable in this picture. One is the palms seen through the shutters, which immediately talk about the south, the light of the Mediterranean and the sea, and the bouquet of flowers across the model, which is a wonderful still life within the portrait. The painting has an exceptional provenance. Uh, it is sold from the Colin collection, a husband and wife team of legendary collectors. Before, it was owned initially by Marcel Capferrer. The painting then went to the States uh, and entered the collection of Valentin Dudensin, partner of Matisse's son Pierre in one of the most important dealerships of the 20th century in New York. And it was acquired then by Lily Bliss, whose bequest provided the foundations of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Painted in 1878, Pierre-Auguste Renoir's L'Ombrelle 
is a masterful painting from the very height of the Impressionist movement. Renoir's fascination with uh, depicting elegantly attired ladies in gardens uh, allowed him to, to fully explore the, the colour contrasts, an explosive variety of, of the garden, breaking down uh, form into incredibly vibrant and, and bold dabs of pure colour, uh, while at the same time anchoring the composition uh, with the female form. The lady in the picture is holding that emblem of, of uh, Parisian middle classes, the, the parasol, uh, which allows Renoir to really explore the, the differences between light and shade in his composition, while at the same time you get these incredibly vibrant and bright dabs of, of pure sunshine landing on the path. Monet's influence over Renoir and the, the two working together in Argentoy may have prompted Renoir to buy a second studio in Paris, in Montmartre in 1876. Crucially, this studio had a, a large wild garden attached to it, uh, and it was this provided Renoir with such inspiration for works such as L'Ompel. The model for the present work may also be uh, a young girl from Montmartre called Nini, who appears in several of Renoir's canvases uh, from the mid-1870s onwards. Uh, Nini also appears in uh, another composition, uh, Nini au Jardin, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and it was there at the studio in the Rue Corteau that Renoir painted his masterpiece La Balançoire, now in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Arbandin Park is a rich, warm and romantic evening landscape that Vasily Kandinsky created in 1909. The painting was executed in Murnau uh, in the, the first few months after Kandinsky and Munter arrived in the Bavarian hillside village not far from Munich. It was here, together with Alexei von Yavlensky and Marianne von Verifkin, that the four artists worked together in, in harmony, trying to create a new spiritualism in art. The figure on the right, in fact, bears a very strong resemblance to Kandinsky's lover at the time, Gabriele Munter. The, the central figure, uh, who appears to be serenading his lover, can be seen as Kandinsky himself, therefore. Like many artists of his generation, Kandinsky saw a direct correlation between music and art. The choice of subject matter, therefore, the, the, the element of music combined with the element of landscape, yeah, is quite demonstrative. Taking his cue from the Bavarian folk practice of hinterglass malerei, which was still very much thriving in Murnau at the time, uh, Kandinsky has created these very strong black outlines of, uh, within the composition uh, and then used his, his colour palette um, to, to fill the, the, the outlines emotively. Camille Claudel's most recognised sculpture, La Bondon, a very rare and important early cast, originally conceived in 1886. Other casts from this early 1905 edition are held at the Musée de Gand and the Musée Combray in France. The original theme of the large-scale sculpture upon which La Bondon is derived was a Sanskrit play in which a couple is separated by an enchantment. Claudel here depicts the moment of their rediscovery uh, igniting their, their passion uh, and, and bringing them together. Claudel was greatly influenced by her mentor and teacher, Auguste Rodin. But the influence goes both ways, and often one can see the, the influence of Claudel in some of Rodin's later works, including L'Eternel Idole, uh, where a, a male figure leans before the, the, the female. An emotionally charged composition in the present work, uh, where the, the woman's hand hangs down over the man's back, uh, and you get this great sense of, of interlocking form uh, and creating of, of space between the forms. The two artists had embarked upon a turbulent affair together, which ended in some acrimony. This resulted in a period of instability for Claudel, in which she destroyed many of her own works, making a masterpiece such as L'Abandon all the rarer. Après le déjeuner was painted in Bougival, where Morisot and her husband brother of the painter Edouard Manet, had rented a house. The house had a large garden, which allowed Morisot to explore the possibilities inherent in the colour uh, and the form of the flower garden. And you can see in the present work that she's done exactly that in the background behind the girl. Morisot has broken down the form of the flowers uh, and allowed her palette to, to, to explode with colour. The painting is filled with a, a vibrant brushstroke uh, very reminiscent of the techniques uh, espoused by Manet, her brother-in-law, uh, and in fact in the direct gaze uh, and powerful look of the, the, the girl. And one can see echoes of Manet's uh, Le Bar aux Folies Bergères, uh, currently housed in London. In contrast to the spontaneity 
uh, and, and, and breakdown of form that uh, the Morisot uses in the background of the picture. One can see in the foreground these beautifully rendered details in the woman's dress uh, and the objects on the table, uh, the carafe uh, and the grapes, for example. Après le déjeuner is a tour de force uh, by an artist considered by many of her contemporaries to be l'impressionniste par excellence. In fact, that opinion was voiced in one of the reviews of the 7th Impressionist exhibition held in 1882, uh, the year after the present work was painted, uh, and which probably included this work under the title A la Campagne. Thank you.